Thanks everyone for uh, joining today. I'm excited to uh, teach this course. You know, it is kind of high level uh, for people who may not have heard about SD-WAN, but it's exciting for me because out of all the certifications I've done in the IT industry and data centers I've built with companies like Broadcom, Wells Fargo, Experian, and others over the years, networking has always been my favorite because it's the platform of communications that everything else rests on. And it was always really difficult until SD-WAN came along, meaning that it was hard to keep all the circuits up. And as soon as any circuit went down, your users were impacted, you'd get phone calls. And honestly, most of the time, you didn't know what the phone calls were about. It would start off, hey, you know, what's wrong with the network, right? And that went away once SD-WAN was deployed. And so I love the technology so much. Honestly, I run it in my house. I have two fibers, two satellite, and two LTE connections uh, in my house. You still own a cloud company, sold it, moved out to Idaho. And so it runs all that connectivity for me. And I've never been down since. So absolutely love the technology because quite simply it works so getting into the agenda we'll talk about what is sd-wan software defined wide area networking how does it work what are the features and benefits why you should have a managed service provider you know telecom like company uh, airspring for example roll this out for you versus just doing it yourself i mean it is a product that's sold by vmware a lot of us who you know virtualize servers virtualize desktops did a lot of virtualization have a relationship with vmware directly why not just get it from them um, got some good news on that, but uh, also are all SD-WAN solutions created equal? Because as we'll see, there's a lot of vendors out there. It's a crowded space. Anytime you have a hot technology, everybody jumps in, whether they really have that technology or not. You know, they almost like slap that label on their product and off they go. And then toward the end, we'll answer any questions uh, that you may have and uh, we'll get started. So building wider networks, like I said, has always been traditionally very, very difficult. Um, and for a lot of reasons, I mean, you know, when I got started in this industry, there's a lot of frame relay and ATM and all these different, you know, protocols and different types of circuits. So, you know, it's, it's really one of those things where, you know, and you'd go into a lot of wiring closets and quite frankly, they looked like this. I mean, it was the spaghetti factory. So even when you're trying to troubleshoot these things, it was really difficult. You know, you're up to your eyeballs and cables. Um, and, and so trying to fail that over, trying to route that, trying to utilize the bandwidth that you had, you know, if you didn't have two equal circuits, you really weren't doing very good load balancing across them uh, between two sites or even the internet. And uh, utilization of bandwidth was difficult. Uh, getting the quality of service was difficult. Of course, there was no quality of service over the internet uh, for many, many years. And most circuits today don't have any quality of service. So when you're trying to do voice and video and a lot of things, um, a lot of circuits just weren't MPLS quality or private line circuit quality. And it was a lot to deal with, right? From a lot of different vendors, a lot of different technologies, a lot of different, you know, CPE or customer premise equipment. And it was just a bit of a mess, right? So organizations need their connectivity and services though to work perfectly and seamlessly. And this is true whether you're a five user, you know, company, whether you're just an individual at home uh, working remote or you're a multinational company. And we've got quite a few of those. We have, we have everybody from, you know, the one person to, you know, tens of thousands of employees worldwide. And, Particularly over the last couple of years where video communication, you know, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, a lot of this stuff has become really important. I mean, even in the interview process, a lot of interviews now are done via, you know, Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Um, people, you know, basically still want to see you, hear you, et cetera, but it's a kind of a high tech way of interviewing and a little bit convenient because I remember having to drive, you know, cross town, going between interviews when I was looking for a job, it gets kind of crazy. So these things have to work perfectly. Otherwise, it kind of reflects on us that, you know, wow, this, this person really doesn't have a great PC or good connectivity, and it reflects on you, reflects on your business. And so over the years, it's become very, very important to improve those, but do it at a cost factor that is affordable to your average person, your average business, because, you know, not everybody can run out. And we all used to have uh, MPLS circuits over the last several years because of the quality, and you couldn't just do a lot of this stuff over the raw internet. Uh, but now you can, and SD-WAN kind of fits that, that middle ground model where you can use the internet but get those private line circuit you know quality that you're hoping for so essentially software defined wide area networking or sd-wan as we call it does a couple of things right it securely connects all your locations together so instead of going out <clears throat> and getting a bunch of private line circuits or mpls or frame or whatever technology you know we've used in the past in order to get you know not only security and privacy but also quality you can now do that with any internet link, any broadband, any fiber, satellite, LTE connection, fixed wireless. We do it all here at Airspring. I mean, we actually sell a lot of these products in over 190 countries, multiple continents worldwide. But you can get those kind of off the shelf, ubiquitous, cost effective uh, technologies, plug them into an SD-WAN box and create all the connectivity you need between your offices. 
as well as, and we'll talk about this more as we go on, improving just the raw internet traffic that you have to any destination on the internet. And that wasn't possible before. Um, you know, a lot of solutions in technology are unfortunately what we call bookended, meaning that unless you have the magic box at both ends of the connection, you don't get the magic, right? Um, now you get the magic from the box and it can be on one side of the connection, the other end being just any destination on the internet. And you can dramatically, you know, 10x even, improve the quality of that user experience dramatically. Um, and it's quite noticeable. But SEWAN is software based and it's cloud-based. So you typically have, and we'll talk about architecture here in a minute, you've got your orchestrator up in the cloud, you've got the box that sits at your site, maybe multiple sites, and then you've got our gateways, which sit in our data center. And so those are important. We'll talk more about those later. Uh, but essentially, if you only have one site and one box, you know, who do you use for the other end as, as you know, a bookended solution is the magic box? Well, that would be our gateways. And then from there, it can go on to the internet. Because what we have found is that in the first three or four hops, that's where you have trouble, and that's where you need some you know, correction of those negative network conditions, whether it's drop packets or jitter or other things. We can correct those, and then you know, once you get up to our data center, you're pretty much on the vast ocean of the internet, and things are, are greatly improved. Our peering, of course, is top notch, and you have a much better experience. And then last but not least, SD-WAN aggregates bandwidth. This was always a problem as a network engineer, right? I'll get a 100 meg circuit, a 50 meg circuit, a one gig circuit. How am I gonna utilize all of those efficiently, right? And, and without having to be a network engineer, just plug it in and you know, let the box deal with it. And that's what SD-WAN does. It efficiently uses all the circuits, all the connectivity you, you have at each one of your sites and can combine that bandwidth together to give you a much bigger pipe. And Think about it like strands of rope. If you had a rope made out of one strand, it could be quite strong, but it's not as reliable as multiple strands wound together into an even sturdier, bigger rope, right? And that's what you wanna do with your connectivity. Uh, we all know that you gotta buy you know, two circuits to have redundancy, but when you get three or when you get four and you start being able to combine that bandwidth into one big pipe, then have the diversity of multiple carriers, that's what makes you truly bulletproof. So two is for redundancy. I say three or four circuits is really when you want to be absolutely rock solid. And I'll tell you, you know, particularly in this country, and we see this, you know, worldwide too, but people love their internet. They want it to be absolutely rock solid. They want it to be like oxygen. They know they need it. They feel like they'll die without it. You probably won't die if you don't have internet, but you know, it's one of those things you just absolutely got to have and you want it to be rock solid. And that's what SD-WAN will do for you. So it'll aggregate the bandwidth. A lot of the features, um, because they are software based, the product continues to improve itself with every iteration. You know, usually a couple times a year, they'll come out with new software and we upgrade. And also sometimes the speed of the box gets faster. Like for example, when the product first came out, um, you know, you'd have a hundred, the 400 meg box would become the 500 meg box because the software became that much more efficient. And so that's kind of a nice thing about the technology versus having to forklift upgrade every time. Um, in order to get some new incremental features. So 10 ways that SD-WAN improves your network. Well, number one, it gives those business critical applications the quality it needs for voice and conferencing and video and everything else over the unimportant applications. I mean, if somebody's just web surfing, that's not as important as you know being on this call, for example, right? And you want that improved and you don't want the voice to be choppy or the video to be pixelated. You want it to be crystal clear. And that's what SD-WAN guarantees. It really guarantees that it's crystal clear. It doesn't just improve it uh, most of the time or some of the time. It guarantees that it's clear, um, even in the most diverse of negative network conditions that can be happening with drop packets, jitter, which is variability of latency or delay, um, sending a packet from A to B. It really handles all those conditions and does it on the fly. Um, a lot of our solutions, for example, like with the you know, VeloCloud VMware SD-WAN, uh, we do Fortinet and Cisco Meraki as well, but with the VMware, it has an artificial intelligence engine that knows when to turn these functions on to correct traffic, right? Turn it up when there's more error conditions happening, turn it down when there's less error conditions happening, and then turn it off when there's no error conditions happening. And so that dynamic nature of the network, which reflects its creators, humans, right? We're dynamic, our networks are dynamic. It responds to those conditions on the fly. And that's something where even as a highly trained network engineer, I would not want to do. I don't want to sit in front of a monitor all day, you know, tuning my quality of service uh, to the needs of my users. That would be an endless task, kind of a mindless task, even though it does require a lot of engineering expertise, right? 
Um, also, you're going to increase your network capacity. I, you know, if I need more bandwidth, I don't have to disturb the circuit that's been working well for me uh, that's already plugged in. I can go get additional bandwidth and, and give myself more redundancy, different carriers, additional bandwidth, and utilize all of that by just plugging it into another port on the box. I save money by tying all these together because I can use any low bandwidth solution. You know, in the past, um, I may not want to get broadband, I'll insist on fiber, but then I have to pay a higher price just to get that quality. Um, now I can actually go with mid-grade or low-grade uh, circuits over any medium. Like I said, it could be fiber, could be copper, could be satellite, could be fixed wireless, could be LTE, and get the quality that I need by combining all these uh, together, right? And then, um, let's see, what number are we on here? And I'm going to optimize that traffic, right? Because I'm prioritizing and correcting and protecting. You know, it's AES, military-grade encrypted, so it's secure. I mean, banks use this, financial institutions, retail. Um, the technology is not new, but uh, the last stats I heard as of two weeks ago, you know, the products for most companies have been out since about 2010, 2011. So over 10 years, but only about half the market has uh, moved off, you know, the old Cisco Juniper type routers to SD-WAN. SD-WAN is your new router. It's your new edge device between you and all your public and all your private connectivity. Um, and both can be plugged into it simultaneously and utilized. So uh, it's going to optimize that traffic. And then number five, works across any combination, as we mentioned, to help prevent downtime. Uh, number six, gives you full control over policy decisions. So you can prioritize any destination. Like, for example, kind of a corny story, but I have four kids and my daughter, you know, came out one night to the living room and was complaining that Netflix was choppy. You know, it was all pixelated. She's trying to watch her movie and yada, yada. Well, I don't own Netflix. I don't own the Internet. But I do have my smartphone in my hand, my iPhone, and I took it out, went to the web page for the uh, orchestrator for SD-WAN. That's your single pane of glass that you control everything from. And I basically prioritized Netflix. And so what it did <clears throat> was it sent the Netflix traffic up to the Airspring data center and then out to the internet. And it overcame all the issues that I guess my local ISPs at the time were having. And it was crystal clear. And she was very happy and, you know, wandered off. It's that easy to deal with things and do it from wherever you happen to be. I could have been at lunch. In this case, I was sitting on the couch with my wife. But it's easy to respond to whoever the users are, even if they're your own kids, and say, okay, it's fixed, right? Before, I had no control of the internet. I don't have any control of Netflix. And so, you know, I just basically say, gee, kid, I guess you're out of luck, right? Not the best answer. And she kind of scratches her head going, well, I thought you were a network engineer. So problem solved. Number seven, increases network security. Like I said, it's military grade AS encrypted. So it passes muster with any auditor, uh, banks, retail, stock firms, everybody's using it. Deploy is easy. You know, it's something you can get up in weeks, not months. I remember particularly with international circuits, it could be, you know, six to nine months, 12 months to get a circuit in. Domestically, it was usually a month, two months, three months to get circuits in sometimes, depending on your location and, and if they had to do different things. Now I have a choice of connectivity. Anything that can get me, you know, connected where I'm at. And sometimes that is LTE or fixed wireless or a combination thereof or satellite, right? We have both geosynchronous and low Earth orbit satellite options now. Uh, LEO or low Earth orbit would be like Starlink geosynchronous Viasat. And so uh, we have all of those and we use those. So it gives you a lot of options, gets you connected literally in days or weeks, not months. Um, last but not least, IP mobility and three-quarter protection. So one of the things that I always uh, hated was when a circuit went down, the public internet IP addresses went with it. You know, they went down with it. And without a public internet IP, you're not talking to the internet, right? And more importantly, when you've got remote access VPN users, you're trying to remotely get into your office using a VPN connection, um, or you've got SIP trunks for voice that are feeding your PBX to your whole office, you need a public internet IP address and hopefully one that never changes and that's always available and always reachable in order for those services to continue on uninterrupted. We can deliver that to you over SD-WAN. So now when individual circuits go down, the IP addresses that we're using on those circuits are used by the SD-WAN box to create tunnels uh, up to our data center to get you out to the internet. So we're not reliant on the individual IPs of the circuit. We're delivering IP addresses to you from our data center to the SD-WAN box that you can then put on your firewall, your IP-enabled PBX with a SIP trunk and so forth. And that's really nice because now, you know, when you decide to, you know, move between buildings or upgrade or downgrade or whatever you're doing, those IP addresses remain the same regardless of the carrier that you're on, regardless of the geographic location and whether or not the circuit is up or down. So your VPN users don't get disconnected. Your phone calls don't drop. 
really nothing happens when all this network chaos is happening in the background. And that's a really great feature to have. We call that IP mobility. Three quarter protection we talked about earlier. That's where, you know, I don't know if uh, this website or this SIP provider for voice or this conferencing provider um, has SD-WAN. And even if they did, I don't know how I'd interface with them, um, but I don't care. I can mark them as being protected in my VeloCloud orchestrator or Fortinet orchestrator, my SD-WAN orchestrator basically, and say, this is important to me, so you know, prioritize it. And as a result, what it'll do is it'll send it up to our gateways at our data centers and then onto the internet. And that does create about a 10x better experience because you know, having you know, dealt with connections all over the world, what we noticed was that bad things happen to you in the first three or four hops. The last mile circuit, right, always used to get blamed. But it's usually the last you know, three miles, as I like to say, the first couple of hops getting out of your internet provider, broadband hell, you know, that time of day when all the kids come to the neighborhood back from school and start gaming and sucking down tons of bandwidth. And you're trying to work, right? You're trying to get your last couple hours of work done and all of a sudden everything goes, goes south, right? It deals with those conditions. And that's kind of the nice thing about it. So three quarter protection helps quite a bit. And that's why it's, it's easy now too, to say, Hey, <clears throat> you know, when you get those offers, right, you're, you're, you know, telecom agent or broker calls you up or even just some random person, they say, hey, you know, I've got uh, twice the bandwidth for half the price. Normally you'd be like, you know, <laughs> that sounds great, uh, but now, you know, I don't wanna do an IT migration, right? And that that's what would stop you before. Now you can say yes to those offers, right? When they call you up because you're like, hey, this is easy. I can plug that in in the middle of the day and unplug my other circuit and have no interruption whatsoever and, and now actually have twice the bandwidth and uh, half the cost and my IP addresses haven't changed just because they gave me a different internet provider or they gave me a different medium that it's being you know, presented to me, fixed wireless or broadband or fiber, whatever it is. None of that changes for me. It's just very easy to make that transition, make the choices that I wanna make in order to get higher speeds at less cost, right? And that's where point 10 kind of brings it together where essentially you've got the agility, you've got the cost effectiveness, you've got the performance, simplicity, and versatility of your network. Um, all the things that I had to work so hard at getting certified as a Cisco CCIE and route switch, which they now call enterprise infrastructure, is just ridiculously easy. And it's easy right out of the box, meaning that you don't have to be a network genius. So SD-WAN options. Um, Obviously, you know, optimization of OTT or over the top services like voice over public broadband, right? Increase the bandwidth. Number two, aggregate multiple WAN links and do all this mindlessly, right? I mean, it does this by its own nature right out of the box. You can certainly tune things further, but the default policy on the box identifies 3,400 applications and prioritizes voice, video, and business critical applications that we use every day right out of the box in the default policy. So 98% of all traffic you would ever see in your life is already handled properly in the policy. Um, I think what used to be unfortunate with a lot of network companies is they wanted you to be a guru, they wanted you to get certified in their product, and that's really not the core of your business, right? So you had to kind of become an IT expert, particularly when you have a small business, and you know what's the point, right? You just want it to work, and that's what it does. Point number three, um, inexpensive, you know, if you wanted quality bandwidth between, you know, if you have more than one office, uh, you had to pay premium to get it. You don't anymore. And that's kind of a nice thing, too. And then last but not least, number four, public Internet to augment, grow and migrate existing MPLS network. So if you have MPLS, you can keep it. If you want to replace it and cut your cost by 30 to 50 percent, you can. Um, meanwhile, if you've never had any connectivity and you're starting to grow and you have multiple offices, you can you can have that kind of quality, but use off the shelf circuit, so to speak, from any carrier and put SD-WAN on there and have that, that quality that you need. And you see that particularly with voice calls. You know, today, uh, over the last, uh, I would say five to seven years as fiber internet has become more common, um, it used to be, you know, with hosted phones, they would just ship you the hosted phone and boom, you know, it works over the internet, but it would work about 80% of the time or less. I mean, it used to be like 60% of the time was perfect and then 40% was a little variable. You had minor issues or sometimes major issues or total outages. As fiber internet came out, that rose to about 80% of the time you were okay, but you still have that 10, 20% where it's not. And that's where I get a lot of the doctors and lawyers and the people who say, hey, I, I have no tolerance for not hearing uh, a word for you know a couple of seconds or having pixelated images when I'm looking at an x-ray or you know looking uh, at a case and I'm talking to my client. I need to clearly understand or clearly communicate 
something. I, I don't have any error for that kind of margin, you know, to have bad things go wrong. So they want 99% SD-WAN can deliver that because traditional internet really wasn't cutting it, both in call quality as well as availability, right? And so as we got away from the traditional, you know, public switch telephone network to everything being on IP, you know, now it's all voice, video, television, pretty much everything we do is internet based. It's not coming from, you know, the public switch telephone network. It's not always coming from the cable company. Um, all of these services are pretty much being aggregated. And that's why sd is even more important, both in the home and the business, because you have to have a way to deal with it. <clears throat> So when you plug these circuits in, they can be, you know, very diverse, totally different types. Um, with most SD-WAN solutions, um, they're Ethernet based. So if you have a TDM circuit like a DS1, you know, old T1 or whatnot, you'll typically put, you know, let's say an Atran or Cisco router to terminate the T1 and then Ethernet off the back of that, handing off to the SD-WAN box. But no matter what you do, you're able to take, you know, for example, three Internet links and combine them together into one big pipe, which is 13.5 megs. So if you're going between offices, you're going to have 13.5 megs if you've got at least that at each site, no matter what the combination or type of circuit. And it deals with this automatically. And for failover, when it's protected by SD-WAN, you know, the things that you prioritize in your policy uh, will fail over in two milliseconds. That's, that's hypersonic, right? Because there's a thousand milliseconds in one second. So two is so fast that no sensitive or voice over IP or any application on earth will drop you or restart your session or cause any issue at all. The rest of the traffic, even if you mark it as unimportant, uh, will fail over within two seconds. So, you know, as internet connections go up and down, you've got alternate choices. You don't have to go make a correction to the router. You don't have to put a statement in there or get your network engineer to fail it over for you manually. It just happens automatically, um, while at the same time combining the bandwidth, securing it with encryption um, and so forth. Um, you can build full mesh, and you can do, you know, hub spoke if you want more traditional, but you can do, you know, typically out of the box, it's full mesh. So as many places, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's in the colo, whether it's at the corporate office, whether it's at your house, branch office, wherever, wherever you put these boxes, they will create a direct encrypted um, path to each other, as well as to our gateways and up to the internet, as well as you can go out the local internet that is at each site. You know, we call that direct routing. And so it becomes very flexible, very secure, and very reliable. You know, in the end, your network becomes something that you don't have to battle, you don't have to think about, you just basically utilize, and it's extremely reliable. Um, and that's been important, particularly over the last couple of years, because, you know, with pandemics and different conditions that happen, um, you couldn't get to the data, some, data center sometimes, you couldn't get to the office, it was closed, you know. So it's really important to keep those links up so that your services don't go down. So hybrid networks, MPLS and public internet, it's inexpensive to just use the public internet versus having to go get those private circuits. But if you have them, you can still use them. And that's one of the nice things about SD-WAN. I remember when it first came out, a lot of people were pushing the internet, pushing the internet. It works with any type of circuit, and that's what's so nice about it. It could be a point-to-point -point circuit, it could be uh, more of a mesh private network like MPLS, or it could just be all types of internet. And there's many flavors you know, available to get the internet. The box doesn't care. Um, what's nice is when it boots up, it, it goes to our gateways and it says, hey, I'm checking in. It gets its encryption keys because they're customer specific, right? Keeps you isolated from everybody else. And and then it says, you know, where's everybody else at? And it downloads this kind of map and then it, it, it doesn't really care what's connected to each one of its interfaces. It tries to connect to everyone else to create that full mesh network over every interface that it has. And that's kind of a neat functionality because then there's no specific configuration per se. You just plug these circuits in and off you go. So three components of SD-WAN. You've got an orchestrator, you've got the cloud gateways, and you've got the edge. So the orchestrator is really just a web interface where you go, you configure it, provision it, troubleshoot it, everything you need to do. Um, this is kind of the era of cloud networking. You know, back when I started, you had to take a, a laptop and a cable and connect to each individual device. It was pretty painstaking. And then when you need to make changes, you know, you either had to do it through that cable or you would use other, you know, protocols like SSH or Telnet to get to each device. But it was a per device configuration. Now you got an orchestrator, you got a web interface, you can put in policies and make changes that can affect one or a thousand devices and do it very quickly and efficiently and roll that forward or roll that back. Um, so that's what the orchestrator is. And because it's web-based, you can get there from your smartphone, you can get there from a PC, any type, Mac, you know, Windows, whatever, that's very easy to use. The cloud gateways 
connect you to AirSpring as well as to the internet for traffic that you want to improve with SD-WAN. Otherwise, you can send your internet traffic out your gig or you know 500 meg or 100 meg or whatever circuit you got directly at each site from the box. Um, but if there's traffic that's important and you're trying to get out of broadband hell, right, then you can send that up to our gateways and then out to the internet. And that does improve the experience considerably. And last but not least, you got the edge. Uh, that's the box that, you know, it's about the size of an iPad, um, rack mountable as you get to the 10 gig, you know, units. But the one gig and below units are about the size of an iPad. They're kind of square <clears throat> and uh, they'll fit pretty much anywhere. And so that's the edge. And those are the only three components you have. Now, the gateways are very important because as you start to expand your world, you know, if you just had the orchestrator and you just had the edge, which a lot of competitors have, then you're on what I call SD-WAN Island. You've got yourself connected and you're connected to the internet, but you don't have any ability to get to clouds or co-location facilities or leverage a lot of things that our data centers are already connected to. And you could add to your SD-WAN experience, your SD-WAN network. So having those gateways is important and we sell solutions that have them. Not all SD-WAN solutions have them, but the really high-end ones always have, you know, number one, number two, and number three. So another function that SD-WAN does, you know, and I'll tell you how it does some of these things. So when I say that it protects you against dropped packets, dropped packets and delay or latency, as they call it in the network business, are the two reasons why your file transfer is slow or your, you know, video is pixelated or your voice is choppy on a call. Those, you know, essentially get corrected by a couple of software algorithms on the box. For dropped packets, what it does once it detects them, anywhere in the path end to end, right? You know, when I had Cisco routers on the internet, they would spray the packets out to the internet and pray they got there. Had no idea if they did or not. SD WAN is totally different because it's an S, it's an end to end solution. It knows that packets are being dropped. And what it will do is turn on packet duplication. And what that means is for every sequence of packets that I need to send from A to B, I will basically look for when I'm dropping packets and I'll send duplicate packets to overcome X amount, whatever the percent of packet loss is for that moment. So I know when to turn it on when I see packet loss. I know when to turn it up when I see more packet loss. I know when to turn it down when I see a little less packet loss. And I know when to turn it off when there's no more packet loss. So it'll do that dynamically and correct those packet uh, dropped conditions because when you're talking about voice and data, if you don't get the packet there the first time, there's no point in retransmitting it, right? The, the visual image has already got to move on, you know, particularly in a movie or anything with motion. Uh, the words that I'm speaking right now, it's no point in repeating it 10 seconds later. You got to get it right, get it there the first time or not get it there at all. And that's how it does that dynamically. Now, the other thing it'll do, though, is, of course, you'll wind up in situations where it's so horrific that it can't be corrected anymore. And you need to move that traffic off the path it's on, off the link that it's on. And we call that path steering. And it'll do this in real time without any disruption to your you know, voice or video conference or movie watching or whatever you're doing. And that's called path steering. And it's very much like when you're, you know, here's an example from Los Angeles. I remember these days when I lived out there, you know, trying to figure out the least congested path uh, to get from A to B, which I don't even know exists if it exists anymore. <laughs> this is an old example back when you could find a path, but sympathize with me. Um, the reality is that, you know, it's finding the best way to send that traffic in real time and then making that adjustment without any interaction from you whatsoever. This is where the artificial intelligence engine that's built into this type of technology comes in handy because it's going to make those decisions for you on the fly. So automatically happens and very, very useful. Application steering. So not only is it going to pick the best path, but it's going to do that on a per application basis, meaning that I don't need to move all the traffic between paths all day. That would be very disruptive, but I'll take individual applications and I know, you know, exactly what they need and I don't have to worry um, that they're not getting the service they require. It knows what voice needs. It knows what video needs, whether it's Netflix or Hulu or it's Zoom or it's Microsoft Teams. It knows what those individual applications need and those needs vary. That's why it has a database of 3,400 applications and individually, it's not just identifying the domains and the IP addresses that, you know, comprise those services, but what they need. What's the delay? What's the jitter? What's the, you know, maximum drop packets that it can handle? And then it'll steer those to the right paths when it can't correct them with those software algorithms anymore. And that's the nice thing about software-defined wide area networking is that as those, you know, as technology improves, those algorithms improve, we can put new logic, new technology into the box remotely without having to upgrade the hardware.
Uh, but this is a very important feature when you're protecting your traffic. And then again, load balancing all of that, making the most use of every dollar you're spending on bandwidth because although it's gotten more cost effective, it's not cheap, <clears throat> you know, relatively, right? And so the ability to combine multiple circuits of different flavors of different protocols, you know, all leading to the same destination, the internet or your other office, whatever, but being able to combine all those together is absolutely wonderful. And having to do it without involving a network engineer, you know, I mean, this is something users do on their own all the time. You don't have to buy bandwidth from us. I think we have some of the best pricing. We have reached to 190 countries, but you know, when we show up, somebody already has internet that they didn't get from us, or they may, I decide, hey, you know what? I actually am just getting a great deal. Maybe it's a friend of a friend. Um, and I want to plug this into the box. We don't stop you from doing that. In fact, uh, for internet circuits, we'll actually take over for free trouble ticket management, meaning you'll never have to call your broadband provider ever again. Hopefully you've got something better to do on a Friday night or Saturday or whatever. We'll do it for you. So that's kind of a nice thing as well, but it gives you that choice. And no matter what you plug in, automatically, without some network engineer like me having to go in and tune it, um, it'll use that bandwidth. It'll figure it all out. So that's why it really is kind of a magic box. And you get centralized control of your entire network, right? Uh, kind of like air traffic control at the airport. You'll see everything. Um, it tells you what applications are in use, how much bandwidth is being used, who's using it. Um, you get a quality display of your circuits. And this goes back 12 months, right? You can see the last few hours, days, weeks, months. And you can see, you know, which ones had issues. And it's an easy to understand colors, right? You know, white means it totally dropped out. Yellow means it had a little bit of an issue. Red, it had some serious issues. Green means it's totally fine. And it creates a quality score. So over time, you know, when those circuits come up from renewal, you're saying, hey, to your agent, to your broker, wherever you bought the bandwidth from, you know, I think I want to go for a slightly higher quality car uh, carrier. Um, on the other hand, you may say, you know what, for the price and the frequency that they're in the green and not the red or the yellow, I'm okay with it, right? Because it doesn't matter anyway. The SD-WAN box is making it look like a 10, even though I'd probably give this thing a 7 if it's all I was using, right? You know, it's not the best internet ever. So it's kind of nice to have that. And visually, this is a great slide because this is, this is really where the rubber meets the road, right? If you don't have SD-WAN and you're at as little as 2% packet loss, which is all we're showing here, you know, you get what's on the left. I mean, I couldn't identify this guy in a police lineup if my life depended on it, right? He's totally pixelated. He's the pixel monster. Uh, however, with SD-WAN doing this all on the fly, uh, you know, it's very, very clear. It's very smooth. It's what I would hope to see. And it does this for all the different protocols that are out there. It doesn't matter if it's Zoom or Teams or Netflix or Google or, you know, I, I recently went with Sling TV for my television instead of Dish Network, et cetera. It just works. So that's why I love it. And that's why I have one in my house. Not to mention all of our offices uh, worldwide at Airspring because we, we use our own technology, right? So as we start to wrap up, you know, what are the benefits here? Why would you want to, you know, I, as I've sold technology over the years, I always had to answer two questions, right? Number one, why do I want this technology? Hopefully we, we've answered that question for you. And number two, why do I want it from you, right? Because why wouldn't I get it from somebody else or do it on my own? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, it's a very, very good, very robust technology. But, you know, what I have found is when you're interfacing this with legacy, you know, networks, not so much the home users, but, you know, you're talking the businesses, right? You've got your local area network. You've got your old Cisco or Juniper router. You've got all, you know, firewalls in there, all this mix. It does require some expertise. So it's not completely plug and play. I would say it is at home. Uh, but when you're talking businesses, you need that expertise. We have those certified engineers and people that are used to doing this all day long. And we work with all types of people, IT people, secretaries, we get it installed. It all works in the end. Um, the implementations do require, you know, a little bit of expertise. And so that's what we provide. And then the time and cost burdens, you know, we're shipping this out. Um, what's included for the price is essentially, you know, everything that you need. So um, the hardware, the software, the support, it's all included. According to Gartner, nearly two thirds of organizations prefer to manage SD WAN over do it yourself. The reason is they don't want to call the broadband provider. You know, as you start using less expensive providers, it's less cost, but it's a little bit more hassle, right? Those guys put in a little bit less money into their support teams than these top shelf providers that are out there. So, do you want to be the one making the call? Eh, probably not. You'd rather be out enjoying your weekend or after hours. You know, by then you're kaput, right? You're done. 5 p.m. comes, 6 p.m., 7 p.m. Uh, you don't want to deal with that. You just want it to stay in line and let somebody manage it. 
that's where you're going to be looking for a managed service provider, whether it's us or somebody else, to put this in and you know manage it for you. So you don't have to call the provider. You don't have to do the software upgrades. If the hardware craps out, somebody replaces it. You know, you can run these boxes, by the way, in high availability mode. So if one dies, you're still running on the other one. Uh, for usually what'll be you know 24 hours before somebody ships you a new box and you plug it in, it's pretty easy to replace. But somebody's got to deal with it. So having managed service is kind of a nice thing. Um, particularly when you look at the landscape, there's a lot of vendors out there calling themselves SD-WAN because it's popular. Yesterday's router to the internet or anywhere is now today's SD-WAN, right? And a lot of those functions, load balancers, uh, routers, have all been integrated into SD-WAN. You're going to see firewalls uh, collapse into SD-WAN as well. That's what, uh, you know, beyond the scope of this webinar, but we call that SASE or Secure Access um, Service Edge where all that security now is being integrated into one platform, one box, it takes care of it. But in this very crowded field, I would say, you know, there used to be 48 vendors, there's now 41. I'd say only 10 of those um, really have true SD-WAN technology where they can correct those negative network conditions. A lot of others will just send you down the best path, uh, but they won't necessarily correct drops, packets, or jitter, or some of these negative network conditions that the top vendors like VeloCloud and Fortinet and others, you know, VMware, which is VeloCloud, um, can do. And those are, the, those are the brands that we sell. We also sell Cisco Meraki, which is SD-WAN Lite. It doesn't correct the conditions. It's one of those solutions that does only pick the best path, but a lot of people have Cisco and that's why we sell it. And they're familiar with that type of interface. So I hope that's given you a good overview and you know why you would want you know essentially to get SD-WAN and get a managed service provider to do it, whether it's us or someone else. I think we do have a lot of expertise around it though. Um, so if you've got a relationship or want one with Airspring, we're happy to uh, entertain it. And now we'll take our questions. Okay. We don't have a lot of questions yet, people. If you want to um, take advantage and write in some questions. But we did have a question about the SD-WAN box. When you talked about the applications, um, does the SD-WAN box automatically discover? Is it Are all those applications already programmed or a link to them or some sort of recognition within the box itself? Like, can you find SAP in there or the common ones that um, major corporations use? I mean, or does the SD-WAN box auto-discover go out in the network and auto-discover what's there? It doesn't have to auto-discover it. Fortunately, with the major vendors like VMware and Fortinet and others, they've already got what they call application identity databases. Keep in mind, a lot of these companies had firewalls and they had load balancers, they had other products where they had to identify applications already and do that network discovery. They've taken that data from over the years and they've consolidated it in the cloud. And then the cloud communicates with the boxes and says, you know, on average, uh, here's thousands of applications, 3,400 in the case of uh, VMware, I think roughly uh, twice that with Fortinet, but you know, even at 3,400, that's more applications than I'm ever going to use in my lifetime. And I use a lot of different stuff, you know, IoT, Internet of Things, and so forth. So that's built in. Um, it's updated automatically because when you think of a lot of services, including from Microsoft or Apple, they're changing the IP addresses and the domain names, um, and sometimes not the domain name, but the IP addresses underneath it as they expand globally or provide service closer to your location they'll add additional IP addresses underneath that domain name. So if you're going to apple.com, you know, there might be literally 30 or 40 IP addresses worldwide that, you know, it may send you to. So that database is constantly tuned, constantly updated. It's not something that you have to, you know, go in and build the policy around or discover what applications you have. All of the Microsoft, all the VMware, all the, you know, social media stuff, all of it is already in there. Okay, great. Um, what kind of reporting capabilities does the uh, SD-WAN orchestra, I guess, does the orchestrator provide uh, mm -hmm. to, to you? A couple of things, you know, if you want a really deep look, VMware came out with a technology called Edge Network Intelligence, and we actually rolled that into our existing customer base for free. Uh, we got a great deal with VMware and said, hey, you know, let's not charge anybody. We don't charge for the portal either. But it gives you a deep look at what applications are running in your environment. Some people like that uh, because they want to see who's, you know, consuming all the traffic. Uh, others who are more security minded like it because they like to see, wow, I didn't even know that application was running in there. You know, today, if you're watching the news, everybody's debating TikTok. Well, you know, with SD-WAN, you could go in and see, is TikTok even running? 
at any of your locations. You know, is this even a problem? Is, does it need to be on your radar at all? Um, if maybe you've decided to standardize your business and file sharing on Google Drive and you see Dropbox, Ignite, PCloud, a bunch of other stuff running, is, is that your employee's just personal use? Does someone hook those up to steal your intellectual property and copy files over from, you know, uh, Google Drive over to these other platforms? Um, and you can get control of those, right, where you can limit those. Um, so it, it's kind of nice to have all that technology uh, rolled in there so you can actually see what's happening. And those reports, you know, can be emailed to you daily, weekly, monthly. They have nice graphs. They can be customized. And furthermore, you've got a lot of real-time alerting, meaning that the way things work now when something goes down, I get an email in about two seconds. I know the site. I know the circuit. I know all this information as to what went down. Now, when I don't get calls from users anymore, but in two seconds, I get that email. The reason I don't get calls from any users is because they're not down. You know, the solution auto fails over to its alternate bandwidth, alternate connectivity, and we're up. And so what, what you'll see is an email within literally two seconds. It says, this is what happened. Circuit drops. You're fine. You're still online. You got other circuits, right? But it went down. Within about 11 minutes maximum, you'll see another uh, email behind that where, you know, at least if you're dealing with us, it says, hey, you know, Airspring has now opened a ticket with that carrier. We're following up to get the circuit up. And then after some period of time, you'll get an email probably from the uh, the VeloCloud orchestrator or the Fortinet orchestrator saying, hey, the circuit is now back on the line. And then you'll see another follow-up from us saying, yes, the circuit is verified online. We're closing the ticket with the carrier and you're done. And meanwhile, you're out riding a bike with your kids or you're at the park or you're you know at the beach or, or whatever. You're doing your thing. You're after hours. You don't want to be disturbed. Or maybe you're taking a nap. You wake up and you're like, wow, all that happened and uh, no issues, right? And nobody's Nobody's trying to uh, yank you back into the office. It just gets handled automatically. And it's another big reason not to do it yourself, right? Great. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, now, does sd make sense or is it cost effective for remote workers or is it more for just multi-location offices? Well, the solution starts off at less than $100 a month, so that's always a judgment call as to how affordable it is, but I'd say it's pretty affordable. I mean, me personally, because I travel a lot and, you know, my wife's a VP for a bank and she's on a million conference calls a day and, you know, with four kids, um, they were finishing out high school, they were doing college, uh, they were doing a lot of different things. When I was gone, especially even as a network engineer, I mean, I could not afford to have my home network go down. A lot of people were relying on it. Um, including me when I am home. And so to me, it's worth the investment. You know, like I said, uh, the boxes start off at less than $100 a month. It's worth it for me to make sure that I'm rock solid when we're all working or studying from home. So, uh, but, you know, and that's true. Uh, you can start off with less than $100 a month and work that up from there uh, because they have 100 meg boxes, they have 500 meg boxes, they've got one gig, 10 gig. It, it scales as needed to, to meet the small business or the really large business and do that domestically and internationally. Again, we sell all these solutions in 190 countries, so you see a lot. Well, and will the basic box cover your usual home executive working or, you know, someone who's doing video calls, a lot of phone calls, a lot of even programming? I mean, will the basic box pretty much cover someone in that situation? It does. It does. You know, the what I've kind of found with bandwidth is we always want more. You know, if you can get a gig circuit and the price is right, you can. Um, out here where I live, I mean, I can get a one gig circuit on fiber for $65 a month. Other places, it's twice that. It really depends. But what I've noticed is that the business critical stuff is typically uh, less than 10 megs per user, right? Because high definition, the highest definition video is not going to take more than seven megs. Usually conference calls uh, that are, you know, multimedia, whether you've got web, audio, video, all this going on is about one to three megs per user. Um, so, you know, if you have a box, even if you have a 100 meg box, right, what happens with a 10 meg license, that's enough to cover all those things. And then, you know, I'm still able to do, you know, let's say if I had 100 meg circuit and 100 meg box, I can still still do 100 meg downloads. You know, that's where I usually want the bigger bandwidth is I'm doing a download and I want that file as quickly as possible. Uh, however, the box can have um, a 10 meg license on it, which means how much of that subset of 100 megs of traffic do I need to actually protect that's business critical? It's usually 10 megs or less. Like voice calls, to give you an example, are only about 100K per call. They're like a tenth of a meg, right? So they take no room, no room at all. It's the video stuff that takes more. And, and even a small box, like a 100 meg box, is more than enough. Of course, these days, <clears throat> a lot of people upgrade to you know, the one gig box because broadband is is getting less expensive by the day. I mean, like I said, I can get that for $65 a month. 
So it's uh, it's all relative to your situation, but yes, it is affordable for home users. Another strategy, though, I'll tell you is sometimes with the doctors, lawyers, professionals, right? They'll put an SD WAN box in because they're the person being consulted with, and then the students or the patients or the clients may VPN in to a firewall. Because think about it, in most situations you may have. 10,000 students around a college, the professors will have SD-WAN because they've got to have crystal clear, rock solid connectivity from their house while they're teaching all day long. And some of these professors may be across the country or out of the country, right? But then the students are around the college usually and they'll use the local broadband provider. So they're all on one network coming back to a firewall that's also on, let's say Cox or Time Warner, whoever the cable co is, and then into the college network that then is connected via SD-WAN to the professors and the people that are teaching the classes so that everybody's happy, right? Because the guys that are local, the students or the patients for telemedicine near the medical campus, everybody comes into the university or the campus. And then a lot of the experts may be much farther away. They need a, a SD-WAN solution to connect them in and make it pristine end to end. A lot of designs can happen. Ultimately, what I'll just tell you is when you switch to these technologies domestically, I typically see 15 to 20% savings. Internationally, it's much higher. It's 30 to 50% savings over what you're spending today. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Good explanation. Okay, next question. Since this traffic is going over an SD-WAN tunnel, um, you, you touched on the tunnel, what about IDS, IPS capabilities, like for a next generation firewall? Sure. So you can use any firewall you want with this solution. The advantage you're going to get, first of all, is that we're going to deliver those public internet IP addresses your firewall needs. We're going to do it to you over the top of the SD-WAN. We're going to give it to you over the top of the SD-WAN. Because what happens with firewalls, they're still kind of medieval devices. They've been around for a long time. And what happens to them, once you know a circuit goes down, you know in the past, you just had to get an, an internet service provider. They gave you a circuit. They gave you IP addresses on that circuit, right? It's the only way they could get them to you. Your firewall would grab one of those IP addresses, and then you'd get another internet connection, grab an IP address off there as well. When the first circuit went down, your firewall switched to the other circuit. Problem is it's a firewall, and it has a mapping table called a state table, which takes your private LAN IP, your 192.168.10.x or whatever IP, and then translates that to a public IP that is required to you know route traffic communicate on the internet and when that ip has to change because the circuit went down you have to fail over to a different ip that mapping table is no longer valid the you know your 10.x ip doesn't map to that public ip anymore because the ip is not available it went down with the circuit so the firewall would flush its table its state table as we call it and all your voice all your data connections would drop um, services like netflix because this would drive them crazy right because your broadband providers intentionally uh, they don't take your circuit down, but they'll change your IP address every so often because they want you to pay $10 or more per month to get a static IP, right? And so what Netflix and some services did is they said, you know what, when you're coming from a different IP and the, you know, the firewall is going to dump your connection, when you go to reconnect, we'll continue your movie where you left off because we're putting a cookie, as we call it. It's a little piece of data that says, hey, this is me. This is my session. This is my account. and I'm coming back to you again. I know I, I look like I'm coming from a different internet connection because I am but please continue where you left off. That's how they get around that is kind of uh, tricky programming. But the, unfortunately, the vast majority of applications on the internet aren't that smart. And so they drop your voice, they drop your data, they drop your conference call, and then it has to reconnect uh, again, or you have to dial back in or do whatever you're doing, you know, and it's a real pain in the, in the rear. So fortunately with this, um, you can use any firewall you want. What I'll tell you, though, is uh, the firewalls are going to go away. Today, we'll give those IPs you use your firewall. If you want ones from us, we can provide them. Most uh, telecom providers can. Uh, however, a lot of that's going to go away because the security is moving up to the cloud. So in the future, you're just going to have one box. And whether there has to be security filtering, like you know intrusion prevention or detection, et cetera, or URL filtering, and beyond URL filtering now, it's not just can I get to Facebook or not. I can actually limit whether you can post, whether you can like, whether you can upload or download or edit or delete or whatever. You can get that granular on every single website now. So website, there's another database. We have all of the, you know, whether it's social media or anything, and, and the granular controls you want your users to have. Like, for example, I might say Google Drive is my business-related file share now, not, you know, some file server anymore. It's usually some cloud drive, right? But then these other competing services, which are used by my employees, 
I don't want them stealing my data. So I'll let them connect to it. Maybe they do need some of their personal files. So I'll say you can download from those, but you can't upload. You're not going to take my stuff on Google Drive, my customer database, my intellectual, you know, my brochures, all this stuff we created in the business and just transfer it over to your own personal drive. No, that's not going to happen, right? And and so what in the past, you know, the only choice you had with a firewall was, hey, I'm going to block that entirely. And then people were complaining, come on, man. You know, I got stuff that I want to access that's personal and I'm not trying to steal data. So now you've got a middle ground where you can say, you know, you can download, but you can't upload. Uh, but all those security functions will move up. But the short answer to your question is, yeah, you can you can do all that, um, but you can do it with your firewall. You can do it with, uh, we have some that are cloud-based or, you know, just means it's in our data center. Um, the rest of this, though, with SASE, as I mentioned earlier, Secure Access Service Edge, no matter who the vendor is in the industry, is all moving that to the cloud because the cloud can see billions of transactions uh, a lot quicker. Okay, but they'll still need the SD-WAN box with SASE, right, Mike? Yeah, that's the jump point. You know, here's a great thing, because I used to own a cloud company. You want to have not a dirt road, but, a, you know, concrete road to the cloud, right? And that's what SD-WAN is. A lot of people today that are doing cloud, whether it's, you know, um, Zscaler, Cato, whoever, it doesn't matter. A lot of them are just doing an IPsec encrypted VPN connection up to their cloud. SD-WAN enhances, as we talked about earlier, dramatically your connectivity. So if you're going to rely on the cloud, don't you want the best road there, SD-WAN is it. IPsec VPN, which has been around for over 30 years, is not. Okay, great. We have one final question. I hope I, I, I interpret this correctly. Can you share general rules on how to price SD-WAN based in the up and down bandwidth? You know, do I have to add 100% sure. of bandwidth of all circuits involved, or only the desired guaranteed bandwidth? Sure. So, you know, and, and it's one of these things that I'll pick on VeloCloud VMware a little bit because they kind of started that model where they said, you know, the licenses in the box handle a combination of your bandwidth of up and down. Um, created a little bit of confusion, right? Because they would say, oh, if it's a 100 meg box, you know, it's really what we mean is it's 50 meg up and 50 meg down. Doesn't really work that way in reality, though. Um, because having worked for a lot of network companies like Broadcom, et cetera, I will tell you that 99% of your applications are asymmetric. They only run in one direction uh, for the bulk of their traffic at any given moment. So if you're doing a download and you had a 100 meg circuit, you could have 99 meg down, one meg up. The one meg up is just your computer telling you know, the source, hey, I got the chunk of data, send me the next chunk. You know, They call those acknowledgement or ACK packets, right? And so that's where the confusion began. Technically, uh, the only protocol that is symmetric, meaning it's sending the exact same amount of traffic up or down, you know, either direction simultaneously, is voice. So if you're sending 50 megs up, you will be sending 50 megs down. However, voice calls, like I said, each call at its highest quality codec or how it's, you know, encoding the voice at most is 100K per call. So that's a tenth of a meg, right? So you can have, you know, even on 10 megs, you can have hundreds of phone calls. It's not a big deal. So typically what we do when we look at these boxes, if we say it's a 100 meg box, I really do treat it as 100 megs because you might be doing 99 megs down during a download, but then turn around doing 99 megs up, upload. And that's totally fine. So when you're running voice, the only calculation we do to figure out how much of the symmetric traffic is going to eat into that is we'll take the number of seats you have. Sometimes we'll ask you how many users do you have, how many phones do you have, how many seats do you have of voice, and we do that calculation, you know, 500 people times 100K, you know, we'll say, hey, that's, you know, 5 megs or 50 megs or whatever, and we'll subtract that from the overall number, and then we'll size the box, because when you look at these solutions, you're sizing the hardware, then you're sizing you know, and that's based on your speeds and feeds of your internet circuits. And if you take the larger of the two numbers, like if you have a 100 meg symmetric circuit, take the number 100. You have another circuit that's 50 down, 10 up, take the 50. Take the bigger of the two numbers. If the numbers are equal, just take one of them, right? Um, and you add those all up. So if I add those two up, I have a, I need a 150 meg box, right? So I'm not going to go with the 100 meg box. I'm going to go with the 500 meg box, let's say, or whatever, the next size up. Um, sometimes that's 250 or 350, depending on what the vendor is. So that's how we do it. It's real simple. And then the license is just, hey, out of the maximum this box can handle, how much of this traffic do I really need the SD-WAN magic on versus just, you know, raw internet access, right? Web surfing doesn't need any enhancement. What he needs is when one circuit goes down, automatically get me to the internet any other way you can. That stuff's automatically covered. When you look at, let's say, a uh, 100 meg box, you only need about a 10 meg license because you're covering your voice and your video, and many times it's not above that. If you have a bunch of users, you'll probably go with a gig box and get a 100 meg license, and it'll cover quite a few more people. So 
Um, sorry for that confusion from VMware. They did that back in the day where they said, oh, it's a combination of your up and down bandwidth and it's not at all kind of mysterious and people used to overanalyze it. Doesn't really matter these days. Honestly, just take, like I said, the biggest uh, up or down number you've got on any circuit you've got, add those all together across your circuits and then size the box accordingly. That's the max that it can handle to the internet. And then with with at least us and many providers do this now too, you can do what's called flex licensing where the, the license doesn't have to be the maximum or match the maximum capability of the box. And that saves you a lot of money. I'll give you an example. Five years ago when we started selling this solution, if you got a 100 meg box from you know a lot of our competitors, Windstream and others, it was about $120 a month. We came out at $55 a month for that box with a 10 meg license. You know, They would only sell the 100 meg box with a 100 meg license you don't you don't even you don't need that not even close right so easy to price out any other okay, questions so in there ellen i think that wraps it up and we are almost at the top of the hour um so right. thank you everyone for we, we sure. did record the webinar today folks so we'll send a a link for the replay uh, as soon as we can get that ready I think we just have one last, last um, unless there's additional questions anybody wants to add. Um, I'll just throw in, if you guys have questions or were too shy to ask online, uh, just email me literally seven days a week. I love what I do. Mike.chase, C-H-A-S-E, at airspring.com. Keep in mind, air has an A-I-R-E, spring.com. So Mike.chase at airspring.com. I'm happy to answer your questions anytime. You're not bugging me at all. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Okay, well, um, we'll send a copy of the deck out too in a PDF format and the link to the replay. And don't forget to enter the survey after at the end so you get a chance to win that $100 Amazon gift card. This is a list of some of the um, services you may need from Todd Dunham if you're an existing Airspring customer. You can find these on the airspring.com website under uh, support, uh, they're listed. Uh, so if you didn't, weren't aware of them, um, uh, you are now, and I, I thank you for joining us today. And uh, we also publish an escalation list, which you can also find on our website uh, at the on the support page. And that is, we try to keep that updated as much as we can, so you always have the accurate contact. And it's it gives you the context you'll need in the event um, you're not getting the service you deserve and are paying for, or uh, you have concerns about something, or if we're not getting back to you quick enough. Although we like to we like to say that we do our best uh, and don't have to use the escalation list, but we know those things do come up from time to time. Once again, thank you all very much for joining us today, and uh, we'll let you know about our next topic. And please uh, fill out the survey and tell us what you'd like to hear about for the next the next webinar that we do. Thanks again. Thank you guys have a wonderful uh, afternoon and a lot of great technology is coming out this year. So do link to Airspring on LinkedIn and other social media, YouTube, et cetera. We've got quite a few good videos about our products, uh, particularly around SD-WAN domestically and globally, because we do have a network that spans four continents uh, that supports SD-WAN specifically. Uh, but you'll see a lot of that online. There's a lot of great uh, cloud and security and wireless products worldwide they're coming out this year from from us and the vendors and you're going to want to keep an eye on that because it really is helpful i'm really excited about um, not only st1 and what it offers today but what's coming this year in the future including a replacement for remote access vpn uh, vmware has bought ananda networks which is one of the only first and only global st1 software client that you can install on now smartphones and laptops and so forth before you needed an st1 box so keep an eye on that stuff link to us you'll get all the announcements from ellen and her team and some of the great videos that they put together that very simply explain all these technologies that are here as well as the ones that are coming. So thank you guys.